Yeah, the, the biggest thing, I think we hear a lot more of these restaurants that aren't going to be able to survive. And even now they're talking about opening up baseball and potentially football in the fall. With Good morning, no everybody, and, and welcome to the Chamber University program. Uh, it's a little after 10 o'clock, so we're just going to give uh, a couple of um, minutes for folks to finish that logging on process. And uh, we'll get started right about 10.03. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as we discussed earlier, it seems like the perfect day to stay inside and catch a webinar. <laughs> We're going to see some beautiful weather, though, after this. So I think we just have to get through one more rainy day and that grilling weather and that we've all been waiting for. We'll, we'll be here soon. I do see that a, a healthy group of participants are, are logging on. Uh, so we will just kind of get started right now with some simple um, housekeeping items. Uh, I'd like to formally welcome you all to our first ever virtual Chamber University. Um, we've uh, been proud to host these programs uh, for a number of years, uh, partnering with some great local companies to provide some really uh, dynamic content to our small and medium-sized uh, businesses. Um, and that partnership is reflected with our relationships with Fraser Law Firm and uh, with Fifth Third Bank. And I do have Jody Promer, Vice President of Business Banking, um, on with us just to say um, a few quick words before we launch into the program. Jody, welcome. Say hello to the group. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I uh, appreciate that. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I believe this is our fifth year uh, straight sponsoring the Chamber University. And like you said, we've had some great programs and Fifth Third Bank is certainly happy to uh, be a part of that. Uh, just a little bit about Fifth Third Bank. Uh, we are a super regional bank headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I think we're about the 22nd largest bank in the country. Uh, our footprint kind of runs from Northern Michigan all the way down to Southern Florida. I think we have branches in 10 states. Uh, locally, we've got 14 uh, banking centers uh, in the Lance, uh, in the mid-Michigan market, as well as our commercial banking office in East Lansing, which I work out of. Um, over the last uh, six or eight weeks or so, uh, the bank has been active in helping our customers and our communities. Uh, to date, we've helped over 30, uh, we've taken over 33,000 uh, paycheck protection loans that we funded. Uh, to the tune of five and a half billion dollars, uh, helping to keep 565,000 employees on the payroll. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've also uh, given back millions of dollars to local nonprofits in various communities, uh, including a $25,000 uh, check to the Greater Lansing Food Bank right here in Lansing. Uh, and then we're soon to move on to our Main Street Lending Program, which is a Federal Reserve Program to continue to help uh, small and medium-sized businesses uh, continue to operate. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance this morning. Thank you very much for supporting the Chamber. And also, uh, thank you to Ventura, uh, our presenters, uh, for what's likely to be a great program. And with that, Michelle, we'll turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Jody, and thank you so much for the continued partnership. It's, it's been a great success, and we look forward to another great series of programs, albeit in the, in the digital space this year. So thank you again. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to, to our presenters and get out of the way and let them share the content that I know that you guys are anxious to hear. Uh, joining me today is Daniel Herzog, Director of Business Development for Venturit, and I'll do my best. Uh, Prabodi Vibad, uh, right. the founder and CEO of Venturit. So he'll probably start the uh, presentation by correcting me. Um, but at this time, uh, please share your screen and Take us away. All right. So thank you for butchering my name. So <laughs> <laughs> you're not the only one, but uh, I know it's not a common name. And I forgive you. <laughs> so can you see my screen? Yeah, we just had to blow it up. All right. So I'm going to start the presentation mode. I have two screens here. 
So, all right, which screen do you see? Yeah, you got the starting screen. You're good. Okay. So, Dan, do you want to give a quick introduction? Sure. So, my name is Daniel Herzog, uh, Director of Business Development for Venturet. Just a, a brief history. I joined the company last year. Uh, many of you may not have heard of Venturet but we've been in the Lansing area for 10 years and we are located in the Technology and Innovation Center right across the street from uh, the Michigan State campus. So we are headquartered here in East Lansing, uh, but we have offices around the world. Uh, we have offices in Colombia, Sri Lanka, India, and we have an operational office in Windsor, Canada. So we're small, but we're big. And uh, we're excited that we're here in East Lansing and we're in a position where we're, we're looking to grow. And uh, Pro, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So these are some of the projects that we've worked on over the last 10 years, uh, over 80 in total. Because of our proximity here in East Lansing, most of our clients have been in the Michigan region, but we have worked with companies in Texas, Massachusetts, uh, and even some companies that are outside of the US scope. So you'll probably recognize a few of those names on that uh, slide there. So on go back one, Pro. So on top of the uh, company venture, we also have some subsidiaries, some companies that we've built um, under the venture umbrella over the last 10 years. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these companies throughout the presentation because we've incorporated artificial intelligence into some of their technologies and the way that they operate in some of their scope. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. So we're gonna get into a little bit of the history of artificial intelligence and just kind of, you know, we need to know where we were before we know where we're going and kind of dispel some of the, the, the myths of artificial intelligence. So a pro is gonna go into some part of that uh, presentation right now. Yeah, thanks Dan. So um, like I said, my name is Prabodha Vibad. And my background, um, computer science, business administration, machine learning, uh, professional certificate from MIT, and also a blockchain um, professional certificate from MIT. Uh, like Dan said, we're trying to mystify AI and chatbots. Um, I know there's a lot of hype around these words. So as business community, what we are trying to do is how best we can use them. Um, so what is AI? You know, AI is a stream of computer science where you train uh, machines to uh, think like humans so we can get things done efficiently and things like, you know, driving us to point A to point B, making a reservation, um, recommending us what movies to watch and track our health, uh, and um, track our machinery if you have like you know auto plant you know which tool is coming up for um, repairs um, so like we said um, we're gonna go cover and try to demystify ai so we thought we will cover what first what are the significant events in ai so ai concept is nothing new uh, you might have heard it recently in the last maybe eight years. It's used everywhere. But um, it goes back into 1940s, even in like fictional format. Isaac Asimov, he wrote this book series over the last uh, 40s to 50s called iRobot. And he conceptualized the artificial uh, intelligence and then in his uh, book series, I think the third or fourth one, he came up with this uh, fictional laws for AI at that time. So the first rule was saying a robot may not injure the human being. And the second ro rule says a robot must obey all the orders given to it by human beings, except uh, in violation of rule number one. Then third one said robots should protect their existence, except if it's in conflict with uh, one and two. So you'll hear about the iRobot uh, a lot during this uh, presentation. 
Uh, apart from that, we get into actual like practical uh, inventions. In 1945, uh, the first uh, computer was introduced, and you can see a picture here. Uh, Van Bush, uh, who's an electrical engineer at that time at MIT, he got a funding from uh, U.S. Army to develop this machine. It's an analog computer. You can see it's. It's like a warehouse size. And another fact of uh, Bush is he's actually a significant contributor during the World War II for the development of the atomic bomb. Um, so, and then um, during the same era, uh, during World War II era, um, Alan Turing, um, who is a mathemat British mathematician, he wrote a lot of uh, papers and published at that time, um, the one of the concepts he said, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Um, so what he meant is he, he wrote a theoretical paper about uh, uh, using chess, uh, training an algorithm to play chess with humans. And uh, he holds the father of um, artificial intelligence, and also there is actually a, a computer science prize considered as a Nobel Prize of Computer Science, uh, named after him, called Turing uh, Turing uh, Awards. And also, it's a known fact that he helped uh, allies to break the uh, Nazi code during the World War II, and that's how there's a significant, uh, like uh, significant events led to defeat. And there's another fun fact, uh, I think when he was a young kid, his um, headmaster was has told uh, publicly that he's gonna be a troublemaker uh, to the society. So we, if we wanna blame for AI, we should blame for Alan Turing because he introduced artificial intelligence. Yeah, and a uh, side note there, Pro 2, if you guys haven't seen it, the movie Imitation, that, yeah. uh, Imitation Game, that was a movie based on Alan, and it came out in 2014, but great movie. We yeah. have a lot of downtime yeah. now, so if you haven't watched it, uh, stream it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, I think he's an awesome guy, and then that was one of the significant events in the, in the AI. And another one is when Frank Rosenblatt um, introduce what the concept of neural networks. So what he tried to do at the time, he had the idea of, with the knowledge he had, the idea of how biological neural system working. And then he built this mechanical neural system. You can see like, it's like a mess of wires, but he built this over years and it's called Mach 1 perceptron. And um, he holds the, you know, the award of building neural networks to train. And what it is, is it has layers of uh, neurons and each time uh, a layer pass forward some knowledge to the next layer so it can understand better. And you see this deep learning uh, word being thrown out everywhere, but it's nothing new. It's being in the computer science for a long time. Um, during 60s to 80s, that era is considered AI winters because you didn't see a lot of like commercials or uh, anything to do with AI inventions, but it's mostly research papers. A lot of good research papers came, but nothing in terms of success came into the market. So the government agencies, and the other agencies stopped funding the university research during this era. So, but on the flip side, we saw a lot of like movies like Star Trek and um, TV series like uh, um, uh, one of the famous one, it's blanking. Uh, can you remember then? Uh, Lost Star in Space. Wars. Yeah. So I flipped the Star Wars movies and Star Trek TV series. That, right? Yeah. Do you remember anything then? I mean, I'm not saying uh, we are that old, but. <laughs> yeah, Lost in Space was another big show back in the day that was getting into that kind of technology. Yes. So, so then after a while in 1997, 
a major event got published. Right? So I call it AI Grace for mainstream. IBM trained um, a AI model called Deep Blue to play chess. And then they invited Grandmaster Gary Kasaparov to play with the machine. And for our dismay, he got beaten. But there's a controversy in there too, because a lot of people say that the machine beat because there was a glitch in the machine. But um, you can see it took more from Alan Turing conceptualizing chess beating a human and took about what uh, almost 50 years to get, come to that what do you think that yeah time flies yeah um so before i finish there are two other significant events in here which are like uh, helping us today one is um, uh, this group of people one from uh, google named Jeff Dean and a professor from Stanford University called Andrew Ng, they trained a neural network, uh, sorry, they formed a neural network with 16,000 plus processors and fed 10 million images from uh, YouTube videos. This was called unsupervised. They didn't tell the neural network what it is. They just fed the images. Um, and it, at the end, the model was able to kind of identify humans, human body, and cats. Uh, so after you train, when you throw images at this uh, model, let's say if you throw a cat image, it can correctly identify it as a cat. So this was a uh, project is called Google Brain, and this led to a lot of uh, new uh, trends. Another significant event in here is uh, uh, a professor from University of Toronto, uh, Jeffrey Hinton. Um, remember, I, IBM, Google were training on these huge processors on cloud. So as, as a end users, we don't have a lot of time access to that. So what Hinton did is he used a computer, uh, a GPU, to do a convolutional network. Uh, so a convolution means that you use, use images and then you uh, apply filters so you can better understand the image, uh, its shape. And um, just like uh, Andrew Ng trained the Google brain, he trained another model using GPUs to identify images. So this particular model uh, actually showed much more improvements than the standard modules at that time. And it had only 50% uh, less errors than the competitors. So he won a bunch of awards and also he won the Turing uh, Nobel Prize for Computer Science. So uh, it's significant uh, award. And that led to today's AI because now with our cell phones, computers, we can easily run AI um, models to help us. Dan, do you want to talk about AI failures? I know I hyped a lot, and uh, I just uh, want to. You know, as we know, uh, you know, science and, and technology is not always perfect, and it's always a trial and error scenario. And as Pro uh, talked about, you know, artificial intelligence has been around for 50 years, almost 60 years. So um, along the way, there are going to be some failures in AI. Um, IBM had a Watson uh, capabilities that they were rolling out in 2011, 2012, and they wanted to use it for cancer diagnosis. And they had all the data and all the information in the system, but it wasn't exact on predicting the, the, the treatment. So some people called it a failure, but it was kind of putting AI out in the healthcare field. And you'll see later in the presentation how that's going to be more and more prevalent going forward. Um, Chatbots is really a popular thing that people are familiar with, with artificial intelligence. And Microsoft uh, launched one called Tay, um, and it was released on the, the Twitter platform. Uh, unfortunately, it, it kind of went rogue and started uh, posting infl inflammatory and offensive tweets. So it had to be shut down uh, quickly after its launch. 
And then uh, also another kind of uh, epic failure in the AI world is with a robot. Uh, Boston Dynamics had an Atlas robot that they were presenting. Kind of reminds me of Elon Musk when he was presenting one of his uh, cars and he threw a brick through the window because he said the window was not breakable. Well, this was a presentation that uh, Boston Dynamics put on uh, with their robot in Pro, if you want to run the uh, video on that. So this was a demonstration where they were trying to show the use of a robot. Unfortunately, not exactly the best uh, demonstration if you're trying to sell a product, right? But as we know, we're always moving forward. So as we were putting our presentation together, okay, you want to recap this real quick, Pro? Yeah, so one of the things we want to remind is the, the robots walking around like humans are far, far away from um, today, but there are um, machines that we can train to do things for us so that we can be efficient and as humans, we can put more into creative and humanity and side. So there is known AI uh, techniques that I want to cover at very high level, but um, I know we have a Q&A session for 20 minutes and any of you wants to do a deep dive, I have some extra slides to explain these techniques. And the most common thing you need in AI is data, right? Without data, we cannot train uh, any model, any anything. And as humans, we also learn either going to university, reading books or doing some sort of a exercise to understand how to uh, respond, how to uh, move forward with, uh, with our task. So first, uh, most easiest technique in AI is called regression. So regression is mostly used for price analysis. And let's say you want to predict a home price, house price in a neighborhood, uh, you compare uh, the, that particular neighborhood and then the number of rooms and number of bathrooms and then you can reasonably predict what's going to be the price for uh, that house. And another one commonly used called classification, especially in um, natural language processing, it's called NLP. Uh, mostly a lot of people uh, try to uh, follow Twitter feeds and Facebook comments about their products and then do what we call sentiment analysis just to see how people uh, like their product or they're talking bad. You know, um, if you see major brands, sometimes they respond on Twitter when people talk bad about them. So a lot of machine learning uh, AI going into that. Another common one, in um, uh, called matrix factorization. So that concept uh, or technique is used for recommendations. So either when you're buying uh, shoes, you, know, you get recommended some socks. Um, so, oh, a good example is like when you're watching Netflix or Amazon Prime, um, you get recommendations to watch uh, other movies you may like. So this matrix factorization is very heavily used in uh, uh, recommendation. And then the, it addresses a very interesting problem we, in the data science called cold start. What if somebody has no history and how would you recommend it? So um, I can go into that little bit details if you guys are interested in the Q&A session. So um, I wanna touch base a couple of things before I hand over to you, Dan, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, Another one is called uh, clustering. Clustering, uh, like you talk, mentioned about Watson trying to detect cancer. Uh, clustering has been used successfully to detect skin cancer using neural network. Another uh, concept uh, you might hear called deep reinforced uh, learning, which is uh, you supervise learn a model and then you put it to learn uh, through experience. Um, good example again came from Google called AlphaGo. Uh, that was a, a game called, just a board game called Go. It's a very difficult game to uh, play, uh, but Google developed this AlphaGo again and invited a lot of people to play with it and then finally invited the world champ of the Go to 
play against it. And unfortunately, the world champ lost. So it's another win for AI. Um, also, you see this being used in autonomous cars, and you can see they're not there yet. There's a lot of has been, uh, you know, mishaps and all that. So um, it's still a developing area. Um, so I'll go to these slides a little later um, in the Q&A, but uh, Dan, do you want to talk about AI in COVID? Yeah. So, you know, the elephant in the room, right? We're all dealing with COVID-19. Uh, we're all dealing with remote learning and working from home. And so it seems like the, the, the big word of late is testing, right? Everyone's got to get tested for COVID-19 so we can have some kind of scale on, on who's been infected or who could be infected. So when we were putting the presentation together with the chamber, they asked if AI has been used um, in COVID-19. So as we talked about earlier, how uh, AI was used for cancer um, screening, obviously it can also be used for uh, COVID screening. So researchers at King's College in London developed an AI diagnostic test that can prevent whether someone is likely to have COVID based on their symptoms. So um, this is kind of a little promotion here for, for Venture It, but uh, if you wanna to go to the next screen, uh, one of our companies, Abbott Heart, was recently recognized, uh, Stardust Insights is a company uh, based out of Austria that tracks technology, innovation, and primarily artificial intelligence and they scrubbed the globe and found five startups that they thought were best poised to do diagnostic testing. And Abbott Heart was one of those companies right here in East Lansing. And actually, if you look at the company to the right of Abbott Heart, CertainL, that's another company that we actually provide techno uh, technological assistance with. So that's a, a partner of ours. So two out of the five companies in the world that are getting into COVID testing um, are affiliated with Venture It. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. And we do have a link on the bottom of that screen if you want to put, pull up that article at your leisure and, and read about that. But we're really excited about some of the things that we're working on um, in the space of artificial intelligence. And actually, Abbott Heart, we're uh, one of the last phases for FDA approval on that. So uh, pretty exciting stuff. So, Pearl, you want to talk a little bit more about Abbott Heart? Yeah, so Abbott Heart, um, uh, it's, uh, we developed, um, it's called um, a sensor. It's a, uh, we were able to get the patent on it. It's a sensor that um, if you commonly heard like Internet of Things, uh, we use that concept here. Um, it's a vital monitoring sensor. It's like a puck and you hold it and we extract your ECG, pulse oximetry, body temperature. And we use that signals to understand whether you have any cardiac risk. Um, we use AI to train and understand the rhythm, heart rhythm, pulse oximetry, and, and then body temperature altogether, try to uh, detect arrhythmia. So what we did is we use a, a neural network and we use gradient boosting. Our network had 420 layers before we came up with the best model, which at the around 98 uh, percentage of activity. And um, like Dan said, we are um, uh, going through FDA in, in the USA uh, market, but we are in Asia and uh, South America market right now. Yeah. Dan, you want to talk about how small businesses can use um, AI? Sure. So, uh, you know, as, as we're going to talk about, and you probably understand is, you know, AI is in every facet of our life today. It, just like technology is. So uh, you may be asking yourself, you know, how can I incorporate AI into my business? Well, where can't you incorporate AI into your business, right? Sales and marketing. Um, we're working with a company here locally. Uh, it's a trucking company. And uh, they get inundated with inbound emails that have job opportunities. And so they have to pay dispatchers to scrub through all those hundreds of emails every hour to see what jobs they can bid on and what jobs that they can fulfill. Well, we're gonna design a software, an AI uh, prototype that can filter all those emails. So it could save them significant amounts of money and operating costs and make their operations much more efficient. So sales and marketing, it can be used for, uh, you can use it for detecting fraud. 
uh, automate customer communications via chatbot. Obviously, anytime you go to a, a website today, the first thing they send you to is to a chatbot, right? They want to try to automate things as quick as possible. The worst thing you want to get is on a phone call and they tell you it's going to be a 15, 20 minute wait, right? Um, you can streamline human resource tasks. Um, you can acquire competitive intelligence. So as Pro talked about earlier, it's all about data, right? The more information you have, the better decisions you can make. Uh, you can use AI to improve inventory and logistic management, and you can also customize options for your customers. Um, another company that we do some work with that uses AI, it's uh, ConnectRN. Uh, this is a company based out of Boston. Uh, as you may know, uh, a lot of nurses that work in extended living facilities, nursing homes, they're contract employees. So where can they find job opportunities? So this company designed the software, we helped build it for them, that can put out job opportunities, qualified nurses can go on their platform, apply for job openings and get placed. So this is all done automated through this platform. And then another project that we're working on, um, once again, this is a local subsidiary of Venture, it is Photosync, and Photosync predicts plant stress. So once again, we pre present hardware and software this plant can detect a leaf and look for potential disease in the plant, potential yield in the plant through photosynthesis. So once again, Internet of Things is a hard device that can be used in conjunction with software to make predictive analysis. So uh, Pro will talk about AI because we know it hasn't been, you know, it's been around for longer than we think. Yeah, so uh, recently, a lot of hype about these uh, personal assistants, right? Um, like Microsoft Cortana, Siri, Alexa, Google, Hello Google, or Hey Google. And, um, you know, I know you must be using them day to day. And um, most of the time, you know, I have trouble with getting uh, Siri to give me anything useful. Uh, last time I asked for a kale recipe and it just didn't understand I was asking for a kale recipe. It gave me some restaurants around the neighborhood. So uh, I just want to give you kind of architecture that how these things are working. Um, so we as human either we speak to it or enter text. And then um, earlier I explained to you this, this uh, big advice uh, advancement in uh, natural language processing. It's called NLP and machine learning, where you train um, the AI models to understand what we are saying. Uh, so it's not matching our sentences, it's breaking our sentences into many things so that it, we can figure out, okay, what domain they're talking about. Domain, for example, I was talking about recipes. So it's food. And um, what I was talking about, like, for example, verb, noun, and its constructions. And then um, you use like uh, a trained knowledge base to go and find answers to what we say. And then you generate the answer and then come back and tell, you read uh, either text to speech or get the text out. Um, so, and also you notice that Alexa and Siri and Google can connect to our devices, right? We can switch on a light, switch off a light, we can on the garage door. So all that is done through this knowledge base. So it's a interesting concept, but um, this is, a lot of people or a lot of companies can use this concept because there are like we what we call in the computer science open source libraries royalty free uh, software we can use and then train the knowledge base particularly uh, matching your requirements and then put these out uh, one of the important thing in here is to like what happened to Microsoft Pay, we cannot uh, train a model to do everything in the world because that's what uh, Microsoft tried to do with Pay, try to uh, talk to everybody in the world and let it learn by itself. What happened after a while, like not even 24 hours, within a couple of hours, people started training Tay to be races and all that. And then it started talking these implementary uh, things. So in 
what I say is we have domain that in knowledge base is limited. So we need to ask the right questions from the AI. And I'm again, big fan of the iRobot. Uh, so this is where answer. it captures. Hello, doctor. Everything that follows is a result of what you see here. Is there something you want to tell me? I'm sorry, my responses are limited. I must ask the right questions. Why did you call me? I trust your judgment. Normally these circumstances wouldn't require a homicide detective. But then our interactions have never been entirely normal. Would you agree? At that rate. Is there something you want to say to me? I'm sorry. My responses are limited. You must ask the right question. Why would you kill yourself? That detective is the right question. Program terminated. Good to see you again, son. So, um, like I said, I was trying to narrow you down to understand that these chatbots and um, all that are limited to the knowledge base. So when you try to ask something outside that knowledge base, you might not get the answer. Um, then shall I go ahead and do the demo now? Or yeah, you can do, do that. that. Do so um, we have set up a demo um, uh, to show you how we can train a chatbot very easily with the infrastructure available from people like Google Cloud or Amazon or Microsoft. For this demo, we use the Google Cloud um, framework called Dialogflow. And with that, uh, we can go and train our um, uh, chatbots to answer the specific domain questions that we want. In this example or demo, we create a East Medical Center. Jane is a patient of that, and uh, she's logged into the center to do some interactions. Um, so in here, um, Jane already authenticated. She uh, entered her OTP code through text to tell this is who I am. And that knowledge can pass it to the chatbot so the chatbot doesn't have to ask again from Jane, who are you? Can you verify? Uh, I send you a text. Can you put this thing? Because it's really annoying because you already logged into the platform and um, here, uh, the scenario is uh, Jane wants to order refills from the uh, center. And my experience ordering refill is you have to get on, especially during COVID, you, they have limited staff. So when you call, you have to stay for a while to get a nurse and then verify who I am and then verify my medicine and then, um, they will send a request to the my preferred pharmacy. We can, that maybe take five to 10 minutes. We can narrow it down to like under one minute using an AI chatbot. So I'm Jane, I'm gonna uh, communicate with this and then we can train the chatbot to understand, hey, Jane is speaking and these are the things I can do for Jane. So. Um, I'm gonna say, yeah, I need to refill my prescription. And we can train the chatbot at that instance so that it keeps monitoring what medication Jane is taking and then what medications coming up for refill. So based on that knowledge, we can give Jane uh, choices, which one you wanna refill. I'm gonna go ahead and say both. And then um, Jane already has said my preferred pharmacy is like, you know, CVS pharmacy in South Lansing. So I don't have to uh, train the chatbot to answer that question again. So chatbot can take the previous replies from Jane and send the prescription to South Lansing, uh, refill uh, request to South Lansing pharmacy, and then continue with the conversation. And I'm gonna say, uh, that's all, and then we can uh, end the conversation. You can see we, we took maybe like 10 minute conversation on the phone and then everything under like nine minutes. Now Jane can save that time to some, do something useful. 
Um, so then you want to talk about the fourth industrial revolution? Yes. Yeah, so why is artificial intelligence important, right? Why is it important to your business? Why is it important to society? Well, we've learned over the last couple hundred years, right, that we evolve. Technology evolves, efficiencies evolve. You know, started with the first revolution, uh, industrial revolution in the 1700s, and everything improved over time in efficiencies. Well, many industry experts believe that artificial intelligence is the fourth industrial revolution, and it's going to continue to affect every facet of our life. And we just feel that if you're not taking advantage of the technologies and the efficiencies that your company is going to be left behind. So the industry experts predict that in the next five to six years, 110 to 140 million jobs around the world will be affected by artificial intelligence. So it's, it's not going away. It's going to be more incorporated into our daily life. And so we encourage you to embrace it and think about how it can benefit your company. So as we talked about, you know, we covered various industries uh, that AI is applied to. Um, and as I talked about earlier, it's uh, you know, applied to almost every industry that's out there today. Healthcare, marketing, logistics, agriculture, real estate, manufacturing, banking, insurance, education. Um, there's a, a lot of different applications that are available with AI. And uh, if there's an idea out there that you've talked about or thought about, and you're maybe just not sure how to push it forward, uh, we certainly invite you to reach out to us and, and have a discussion and to see if it's something that has some viability that we could bring uh, to, to fruition. So on, on top of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, we are a, a full service studio here in, in East Lansing. So we do offer product design, full stack development, data analysis, uh, cloud support, internet of things, quality assurance, business analysis, 3D and multimedia production, blockchain, and system administration. And uh, I believe, did you have another slide there, Pro? Or This is the executive team that we have uh, in place at Ventureit. So uh, as Pro mentioned, he's the CEO and founder of the company, and he oversees a lot of our subsidiaries too. He is the, uh, the man behind the curtain, as they say. Um, I'm here in East Lansing along with Victor. Uh, Dunishi is our operations manager out of Windsor, Canada. Uh, Kalpesh is our director uh, of software engineering based out of India. Uh, Maria is based out of uh, Columbia. She heads our design team, which has been growing and we're really excited about some of the things they're doing in that space. And Vashali is also working with our team in India too on the development side. And uh, Michelle, if you'd like at this time, I guess we can open it up to Q&A and answer any questions that uh, the audience may have. Well, that sounds great. And thank you so much for sharing all of that information. Um, it's been quite a fascinating journey for, for AI through the years. And um, it really truly is remarkable how prevalent it is um, in all of our worlds. So thank you again for, for all of that valuable information. Um, I do have a couple questions, so we'll just, um, I'll throw these out to you guys and um, you can tackle them as, as uh, you see fit. So one of the questions or one of the thoughts was, um, you know, technology can be a case of kind of chasing the next shiny thing. Um, you know, how do businesses kind of sort through all of this technology um, that is being thrown at them and, and determine whether or not it, it's a must have for their business? Um, uh, should I take that question, Dan, or you wanna? Yeah, I, I might ask them at the end, but go ahead and start it off. Yeah, so there's a lot of like, uh, like at the beginning we said we wanna demystify what this AI is like. A lot of people think this AI is, you know, self, driving cars or things like that. But towards the end of it, if you really look at, there's a hype around it, but what is coming down to us as small businesses is how can we use it to our advantage to improve our efficiency? So we have limited number of resources, limited number of uh, limited cash flow, right? We cannot hire many people. So is there things like we can, use AI to automate and be more efficient than us, right? One example I can think of is like human resources, right? How do we find good 
um, candidates uh, to hire, right? And you don't have to build those uh, platforms or um, um, applications from ground up. You can use existing application or frameworks to do that. And uh, then you can reduce the time of, you know, going through these resumes and internet or hiring these um, staffing companies to do that. Um, another example, like we told you, is like showed you in the demo in the context of a medical clinic, but it can apply to your, let's say you are uh, selling um, uh, car parts, right? And then if somebody wants to know, you know, your inventory, whether you are having this and you don't have to answer, it's on the phone, you have, a, you can have a chat bot answering for those. And uh, then you, you, for example, you brought up this uh, logistic company who's getting hundreds of hundreds of emails for jobs, right? You want to explain that? I think that fits into this question really well. Right. So once again, it's, it's, it's all about efficiencies. You know, you, you got to try to streamline your business because no matter what business you're in, there's going to be a level of competition. And especially, I think, what we've seen recently with the COVID and the, the lockdown and a lot of businesses have had to change that the, with the way they're operating, right? Uh, we do a lot of work with Michigan State with online education and online learning platforms. Well, you know, who would have thought three months ago that that was going to be the standard norm for everyone going forward? You know, elementary all the way through college age, uh, you know, students, everything's got to be online. So, you know, some people had the platform and were prepared for it. Some people were left behind. Uh, another thing that comes to mind with the, the COVID situation is online ordering, right? Some companies did not want to invest in a technological platform to maybe like a restaurant to make online ordering simple and efficient. Well, you know, when that became the only way you could get your food, you know, they lost out on that business and that went to the competition. And so probably a lot of those companies might not survive, uh, you know, a lockdown. So, you know, there's, and as Pro talked about too, there's a lot of technologies that you can build on. You don't have to like reinvent the wheel. You just want to make the wheel a little bit better. Or maybe you need to fine tune the wheel to your particular industry or your particular company. So that's what we take, you know. Uh, you know, you look at like Uber and, and some of those other companies, you know, Lyft didn't invent it. They just took what Uber was doing and they just created another platform. So you can borrow ideas and technologies and, and use them for your benefit. And that segue is perfect in, into a question I just received um, specific to the restaurant industry or the retail industry. You know, other than chatbots, what other functionality would AI have in, in those specific industries? Um, well, one that was brought to us was inventory control. You know, so some restaurants, if they, you know, if they have multiple locations and they're trying to manage their inventories, um, you can automate that process. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, uh, staffing. Uh, you know, we have, uh, there's people that own multiple franchises. Well, you know, those people work part time and maybe they have got 20 locations in a metropolitan area. How can they manage those staffs? Because as we know, a lot of those part-time workers, a lot of times are high school kids or maybe not the most dependable workers. They need to make sure that they got those shifts filled. Um, if they had a platform that they could make those opportunities available to their workforce, they could fill all those spots in a, in a good way. Yeah, especially in the retail, um, this uh, pro detection, for example, you can uh, use AI in um, to understand like uh, a lot of uh, time, uh, we hear from uh, retailers when it's a cash run business, uh, there are certain times that there had been fraud, especially from the people handling cash. So um, those can be done. And um, there are many other uh, uh, examples we can give, but uh, if there's not a couple of other questions, I'd like to maybe hear them before I go into because Dan and I can talk all day. So <laughs> I don't want just to answer one or two questions. Um, well, these two questions kind of go together, but um, you know, what are the most important factors to weigh when you're considering implementing some, some AI functionality in your business and, and kind of dovetailing with, with that is how do you take an internal look and identify those systems or processes or, or areas or tasks where AI can come in and really help? 
Yeah, I'll start pro and I'll let you wrap it up. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, I'm new to this company, so I'm actually somewhat new to the technology world. And one of the things that really impresses me with Pro and, and his team is when we consult with a client or prospective client, it's doing a case analysis, right? So here's your thought, here's your idea, is it viable? You know, what's it gonna cost to build the idea and is it gonna be profitable at the end, right? You don't wanna invest $100,000 in your business if you're gonna get a net $50,000 in benefit, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So. You know, we want to build technologies and efficiencies that are going to have long-term returns for, for the business. You want to elaborate on that, Pro? Yeah, so um, some examples you can be like, uh, if you are doing uh, machinery, right, uh, to understand, you know, how to plan for repairs, plan for refills, those can be automated using uh, AI very easily. For example, if you're using a needle, if you know the lifespan of the needle, we can have sensors built into like uh, Internet of Things sensors built into those machines to understand how uh, many times it's being used and monitor them for making sure that you don't have to stop the flow for um, getting the repair, like the parts in. Um, so we, we can be more proactive giving you a heads up. Hey, you know, these parts gonna go away, gonna get, uh, need to be replaced and uh, you can be more proactive. That's one of the simple example I can kind of bring you the internet of things and also efficiency and also AI where we can apply and um, Great. Well, you know, one thing that we've definitely seen, um, you know, COVID has definitely shown us is that um, technology certainly isn't going anywhere. And if it's an area that you have not invested in yet, it's something that needs to be done. And, um, you know, how, as you look at how COVID has impacted our workplaces, you know, what are those opportunities um, for businesses who maybe were early adopters of this technology? And, you know, what are some recommendations you would make for folks to um, maybe get engaged or, or start? Yeah, so um, one of the challenges everybody is having is like, if you need to go to uh, your office to perform your task, right? And, and staying home, uh, if it's not, um, you know, we call digitalize. Um, it's very hard, right? You need to start understanding how you can, if you are a traditional company and you have not using a lot of technology, you need to do this gap analysis to understand, you know, where you are, what need, what things you can use technology first. I mean, you can forget about AI because I know some companies, they, they're mainly relying on people going and doing some tasks on a machine, for example, right? Uh, so um, you need to understand that technology gap first. And then once you understand that gap, you have to plan for the digital transformation. So once you uh, figure out what the uh, digital transformation goals are, then you can figure out, okay, what things we can use AI and what things we can further improve and that kind of process we take with our client uh, normally. So uh, that's a good way I can tell you like how to think through this process. Great, um, I don't have any additional questions, but we have five minutes left. So if you guys have any you know, final thoughts to, to wrap up this webinar, I, I would welcome those um, as well. I know that you have your contact information um, on an additional slide. Um, why don't you go ahead and get, get that brought up. Uh, we'll also make sure to send this out in a follow-up email uh, to all of the attendees as well. But uh, why don't you guys take a, a couple minutes for your final thoughts uh, to wrap us up today? I just say one thing, I think Pro's a little modest with uh, Avid Heart, which is one of his companies. And a lot of people are familiar with Fitbit and even the Apple Watch, which can track your pulse when you're getting your workout in. Um, but what's unique about this device is it can actually track the, the, the uh, amount of oxygen in your blood and your body temperature, which as we know, body temperature is the big indicator for COVID-19. 
So when you have a, a, a device that can track all three of those components, and more importantly, send it to a software app that you can share with your medical professionals or even your family members. So when, when I think of my parents, or you think about older people in our society that maybe are living alone or in a nursing home, this is a very simple way that they can track and monitor their health on a regular basis. So it's all about being proactive, not reactive, right? So you can you know, get the attention they need before they have a stroke or they have you know, a serious health ailment. So uh, I would just say a little commercial for that because that just really fascinates me what he's done with that product. Yeah, while you're talking about Avatar, I played the video on the website. If you guys are interested, you can go to avidheart.com and uh, look at the product. Um, and we are very proud of it. Um, we have come a long way. Uh, like uh, I said earlier, we have patent, we have trained uh, AI model to even uh, to the level of Apple Watch. So we are so proud of that project. Um, um, we have a couple of more minutes, right? Um, I want to get a little bit geeky uh, because if some people are, uh, are listening and they're disappointed that I didn't go, okay, through uh, some of these concepts of AI, um, I talked about a uh, classification model or technique. Classification, again, uh, I used NLP where you can have things uh, tag and then the model can separate them. For example, news articles and uh, politics and uh, with the classification model, uh, you can separate them. Another one I talked about is regression analysis. Um, this is, uh, you can have multivariant regression analysis. So here it's a three dimensional. You can have a price and number of rooms and windows and then you can get the regression and predict the, uh, this is a neurons in neural network where you have multiple layers, each neuron interacting with each other, and then you can get an output. Most of this is used um, uh, in uh, uh, like the example I gave you, uh, Google Brain and also the Hinton's uh, uh, model, he came up to identify uh, images. Um, another one is called metric factorization. I talked to you about recommendation. This is how they, the, the technique breakdowns. You watch a movie and then you try to figure out what the genre, what other features that movie has, and then you break it down to feature by movie and use those techniques to um, kind of uh, find out the recommendation. So, yeah. So, those are like some of the concept. Um, I would love to have a conversation with you. Like I said, my background is computer science, so I'm happy to uh, have those discussions. And um, here are the references. Uh, we will distribute with these slides. Uh, if anybody wants to do further reading, I recommend these website and these publications that we have referred in this. Over to you, Dan. Yep, just wrapping up, there's our contact information, uh, venture.com, and of course, we're on all the, the social channels now, like everyone else, it's like kind of the, the new way to, to, to market and advertise yourself, but we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, and, but yeah, we are, are available for consultation at any time, um, whether it's in person or via phone or via video conference, if you have any ideas or questions, Certainly feel free to reach out to us. We'd be glad to be a resource for you. And we thank you for spending your time with us. I know it's hard for everybody to stay at home, but, um, you know, stay strong. We yeah. can get, get out of this together. And uh, once we get out, we'll be stronger than before. And again, thank you so much for listening. I couldn't have said it better. So thank you so much. It is 11 a.m. Uh, we will let everybody go and continue on with your day. I hope everybody has a great Thursday. And uh, thank you again, Daniel and Pro. It was great to hear from you guys. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the chamber, for the opportunity. We really Absolutely. appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye now. Bye.